It feeds in nicely to what I want to talk about. I think we're looking at the problem, uh, the same problem, um, just from two different perspectives. I'm a computational guy, and I'm looking at individual quantum dots and transport of one electron between two quantum dots, that sort of thing. And he actually understands why that's important. So, so um, here's our school again, the Colorado School of Mines, uh, physics department, come visit us sometime. Um, I'm going to talk to you about the math and the modeling of uh, quantum transport and its charge hopping that Matt talked about. And I want to point out a couple of references uh, that I think are particularly important. Um, this book by Kuhn and May is fantastic. If you want to learn about charge transport, you need to have this book. There's even a, uh, I have a hard copy of it, and there's even a Google, you know, ebooks copy that I carry around with me on my iPad and my laptop, so I'm never without, okay? Um, great book, another one by Schatz and Ratner, a little teeny book, a little paperback, kind of a, a cheap book to buy, and a fantastic resource, okay? Then there's some other ones by Cato and uh, Delarue uh, that are also good. Okay, so what sorts of things uh, am I interested in? This is the same thing that, that uh, Matt was talking about, but I'm trying to set the stage, my perspective on, on things. I have one molecule here, this is P3HT, and maybe C60, or two molecules joined together with a, uh, a little benzene bridge, or here, benzene dithiol between two silicon quantum dots that each have 35 uh, silicon atoms. This is the kind of scenario that I'm interested in uh, understanding uh, charge transport within. And we look at things like char electron hopping between the dots, uh, charge separation between the dot and um, maybe uh, a, a whole transport material, uh, the uh, recombination, the photoluminescence lifetimes, these are the kinds of things that we're trying to embed. Right? Um, in particular today, I'm going to be focusing on this uh, P3HT uh, system with uh, a silicon quantum dot. Um, that's not a complete picture. Okay, this is a little... Wow. Okay, there. That's all. All right, so here's, here's what I want to look at. It's a um, silicon quantum dot polymer blend of P3HT, and the only difference between this and the PCBM uh, P3HT system is that now I've just replaced the PCBM, the fullerene based part, with uh, silicon quantum dots, okay, little nanocrystals. And in our world, we're going to draw the P3HT something like this, just a little short uh, piece of the polymer. Okay, and here's the silicon quantum dot. We put them together, we separate them by four or five angstroms, we orient them in a way that we think is important uh, by doing a density functional theory uh, calculation to let them geometry optimize. This is the low energy state, and then we want to look at the uh, charge separation and charge hopping in this little system. Okay. Matt uh, talked about this so I can, I can go kind of quickly. There are many different types of transport between these nanostructures. There's the uh, a full uh, extended, you know, wave-like transport, coherent transport. There's a uh, transport of direct tunneling. Um, there's the straight kind of Boltzmann transport hopping. And then there's the one that we're interested in, and this is the regime of phonon-assisted uh, tunneling. Okay? And so this is exactly what Matt was arguing for, and it's what I want to focus on as well. I don't think I need to go through the, I just want to have all these together. Okay. That's there. Okay. It's easier to show you when I just can point like this. All right, here's, here's what we're interested in. We have an electron hole pair generated on the P3HT, and the electron drops down to the, uh, to the silicon quantum dot. And so we want to look at that, the rate of charge separation. Another possibility is that the exciton just recombines, and so we want to look at the rate of charge recombination, CR in this context, on the P3HT. Then another one we want to look at is the rate at which the charge separated exciton, the dissociated exciton, recombines into an exciton that's sitting on the P3HT. So we'll call that charge recombination from the interface. And then finally we want to look at electron hopping between two adjacent silicon quantum dots. And we also do this kind of thing with bridge molecules, but uh, for right now we'll just look at it uh, without anything in between. And I want to calculate the rates of all of these processes. Now, 
In order to do that, I need to set the, the stage. What sort of setting are we looking at? One uh, possibility is a full diabetic setting. Another is an adiabatic setting. And then oddly, this sounds like a non-adiabatic setting. You should be able to cross off the non and the a. And don't you end up with diabetic after that? No. All right, so what, what's the difference between these three? A diabetic setting is a full thermal uh, participation. Phonons are completely involved in the process. An adiabatic setting is one, this is the Born-Oppenheimer approximation, where there's, there's no phonons involved. You assume that the nuclei are kind of frozen in place and everything is just electronic. And then the non-adiabatic setting, within the context that I'm interested in talking about, is when the phonons play a role in helping to assist the transport of the electron or the hole. Okay? So here it's phonon-assisted electron transport. That's what I mean by the non-adiabatic. <coughs> I want to show you some pictures that, that uh, will set the stage for this non-adiabatic charge transport. And I think, I, I want to pulse you on this. Is this a picture that's familiar to you? Most of you say, yeah, okay, let's just go over it real quick. The idea here is that we have a low energy uh, potential energy surface and a higher energy potential energy surface, and we're exciting, say, the ground state of the low energy surface up to the, an excited state with phonons in the, uh, the high energy surface. Okay, so the photon is getting a, giving us a vertical excitation. This is uh, within this Frank Condon uh, idea, and we're going to handle this quantum mechanically. Okay? So we're going to account for both the, the uh, electron uh, structure and the phonon structure uh, quantum mechanically. If I abstract this into a Jablonski diagram, it looks something like this, and I intentionally kind of focus on a particular type aspect of the, or piece of the Jablonski diagram, just to make sure that, uh, that you understand kind of the, what we're interested in. Here's that vertical transition up to um, a, a phonon assisted, or pho with additional phonons, so it's a hot electron. And then we can have uh, an internal conversion going over to another energy surface. So now we're looking at a relaxation process. So internal conversion over to this S1 uh, potential energy surface. And now a couple things can happen. The thermalization can be associated with collisions, so my little molecule or my silicon quantum dot or the P3HT, whatever it is, can be involved in thermal collisions and can reduce its energy uh, by the collisions. It can also have this intermolecular vibrational redistribution where the energy is just redistributed among the different modes, uh, the phonon modes associated with the molecule. So that's energy redistribution within the molecule or the quantum dot itself. In any case, the, the uh, phonon energy is uh, going down, and eventually I can reach the uh, conduction band edge, then I can fluoresce. And in this case, the way I've drawn it, it's a phonon-assisted fluorescence because I'm going down to a hot electron state, and I have these additional phonons involved. Okay, So this would be a photon plus some phonons. And I could have even gone higher and had phonons uh, being uh, assisting the fluorescence process and going down to the ground state. So a combination of photons and phonons is what we're interested in. Okay. Here's the picture that I want to focus on. This is just the, the charge separation from the P3HT where the electron's going to come down into the silicon quantum dot. And I want to calculate the rate at which that happens. In order to do that, I want to idealize this picture because I want to show you how, uh, how phonons play a role in this, uh, in this transition. So instead of these two pictures, I'm going to focus on these two pictures. And I want to explain what I mean here. If I take the, uh, the ground state of the system and I put uh, an exciton on it, I excite one of the electrons, what's going to happen to the P3HT? It's actually going to change its, its shape, right? It's going to change its configuration. It's going to relax into a new configuration. And let's pretend that configuration is right here. And the new ground state, or the new structure, is one that can be completely characterized by this reference spacing between two 
uh, objects. Now, what I'm what I'm showing here is this is the the Q is just a single vibrational mode. Okay? So the Q is a kind of a reaction coordinate here, and this is in its reference state. <coughs> now I transfer the charge, I transfer the electron over to the silicon quantum dot, and now I'm showing the single reaction coordinate as having changed the equilibrium position of the system. Okay? So now the new configuration is something like this, where the reference is Q02, and now I might have a different stiffness, a different vibrational mode of the system. So I want to go back two slides and show you that you already have this. The ground state here is different than the ground state here. We're plotting a single reaction coordinate, and that's all I'm doing in this case. Okay, so before I go on, I want to make sure that this, does this make sense? Okay. Small numbers. And the energy surfaces here are E01 and E02, the, the bottom of the energy surfaces. And so if I can replace these two pictures with these two, then I can now talk about how the, the uh, phonons can help to uh, aid the charge transfer between those two structures. And now comes some math, all right? Let's, let me go through this. It's not so bad. I'm going to talk about the Hamiltonian of this, the decoupled system first. So the color scheme here is supposed to be helpful. I'm going to, I have these two configurations. This is the Hamiltonian associated with the first configuration initial. This is the Hamiltonian associated with the second configuration final. All this is doing is saying I have a quadratic surface and it's centered at E naught 1. And I have another quadratic surface centered at, with the energy levels E naught 2. Okay. So this is the decoupled Hamiltonian that I can use to describe that system. No phonons, uh, just, just a single phonon, this reaction uh, coordinate. Now what I do is add some vibronic coupling. So now I have this electronic uh, coupling between the initial and final states. This is my new Hamiltonian. And with this, I can plot the potential energy surfaces, diabatic and adiabatic surfaces. And it looks something like this. Here's, if I write this in terms of the eigenkets of the decoupled Hamiltonian, I can take this Hamiltonian and write it as a two by two matrix. And here's what it looks like. In other words, these are the energies, the eigenvalues, that describe a little parabola as a function of the reaction coordinate. So this is the eigenvalue for surface one, this is the eigenvalue for surface two. If I now include the electronic coupling, my new Hamiltonian matrix is a two by two matrix like this. If I diagonalize the matrix, I get two new surfaces. These are the adiabatic potential energy surfaces. And these are plots that you, I think you've probably seen, a lot of you have seen before, and here they are. So here is the is the pure parabolic surface pair. Okay, the light blue and the dark blue surfaces are the diabatic surfaces. And then when I allow mixing, I get these adiabatic surfaces, the red and the green. And what I'm interested in is doing a charge transfer from the before state here to the after state there. And I want to include this, this vibronic cup. Okay? So that's the situation that I want to model. Okay, I want to go from there to there. And I want to allow phonons to help me out. I'm going to use Fermi's golden rule to do this. And yesterday when I said, how many people uh, are familiar with Fermi's golden rule, I got kind of a, like a, a weak response. Okay? And I felt bad about that. So I, I want to take a little break and I want to talk about Fermi's golden rule to make sure that you understand the basic idea because that's what I'm going to use with phonons to describe the rate at which electrons uh, move from one well to another well. Okay? With this vibronic coupling. So here's a toy prop. So three slides or so of, of taking a break to, to talk about Fermi's golden rule. All right? If I have a Hamiltonian with kinetic and potential energy, and I diagonalize it, I can write that Hamiltonian like this, where I just have a bunch of energies. Okay, for each one, I have a, uh, an eigenkette. N goes from 1 to N, as many states as I have. In the simplest setting, I can separate all of these energy levels by some 
just a little energy amount delta, the same energy amount. And so I have n of these n of these states, and E is just described by you take an integer and multiply it by delta. And then I can turn on, that's this first part right here. Okay. Then I can turn on a coupling between these states. Oh, actually, these first two parts are the all the energy levels. Then I can turn on, this is a, a heavy side step function. I can turn on a electronic coupling between the states. And all I'm going to do is call out one of the states, Q, this is my initial state, and I want it to couple to all of these final states. And they're all going to be coupled in the same way. And that's what this piece of the Hamiltonian does. So now I have this Hamiltonian that's going to describe the electronic coupling between the states. And I want to see how this evolves. Now, Here's how we can do it. It's not, it's, it's no, no great, uh, it's not uh, rocket science, it's just quantum mechanics. If I, take, if I take this wave function and I look at a linear combination of all of these eigenkets, I have this C that's a function of time. This is just a weighting. And I'm going to take that and stick it in the Schrodinger's equation. All right, just single part of Schrodinger equation. I'm going to stick it in. Here it is. Here's the Schrodinger equation. And now I put in the Hamiltonian and I simplify it. All I get is a set of ordinary differential equations. These two differential equations, actually this is a whole set of differential equations, describe the occupation of these states as a function of time. So here's the idea. I'm going to start off in this state, okay, some state of the system. It's my initial state. And I want to find out the rate at which all of these states become occupied. Okay? This is the basis for Fermi's golden rule. Fermi's golden rule says, if you have an initial state and a whole bunch of states packed right next to it, that are almost the same energy, then this state is going to couple to these, and it's going to slowly decay away. And all the other states are going to slowly increase their occupation probability. And Fermi's golden rule tells you the rate at which this happens. And that's what we use in all of these rate calculations for incoherent processes. So I take, I take these two differentials. Well, actually, this is um, a lot of differential equations on account of I let n go from 1 to 300. Okay, So I have 300 differential equations. But Mathematica loves this kind of thing, and I can do it on my laptop. And I solve these 300 equations using Mathematica, and I get this result. In fact, it runs in about a second. Okay, it's not a big deal. Um, and here's what happens. The initial state starts off with an occupation probability of 1. And all the final states, all the other states, start off with an occupation probability of zero. And as time goes on, you can see that this state, the initial state, disappears. It starts to go down exponentially. All the other states start to rise. Okay. And so they're all filled in. And I want to show this in a different way. The same data here in a different way. It goes like this. Here are all of the states. There's 300 different states. I just chose 300 arbitrarily. Here's their occupation probability. This is at time zero. And this, the range goes up to point 0.2. So the probability of occupation, I'm only showing up to 0.2. But really, the middle state, state 150, is all the way up here on the ceiling somewhere. It has an prob occupation probability of 1. And I watched this as a function of time. And the initial states here form a little bump, and the bump kind of tightens up and tightens up. And right here, at a certain time, I start to see this dot. This dot is the probability of occupation of the, of the middle uh, of the initial state coming down. It's now at 0.2, and now it's at 0.1, and then it goes down below. And meanwhile, all the other states around it are getting tighter and tighter. Until finally, what you have is a delta function of all of the states around your initial state. And the initial state is kind of dissolved into that delta function. I wonder, I don't know if it's worth doing or not, but uh, I'm going to risk something here. And it kind of, let's see. Here, can I do this? Can you guys see? Oh, you can see it. So if I run this, maybe I'll make this. Let's 
see if this works. Oh, that works. Okay, so that's what's happening. That's mathematic activities, okay? And you can see this delta function forming, right? And the initial state is kind of disappearing, and all the final states are being occupied, but they're being occupied tighter and tighter uh, in energy around, you can think of this as energy, around the initial state. And it's this delta function that you see in Fermi's golden rule, the delta E initial minus E final, that is saying that if the energy of the final state is very near the energy of the initial state, then I'm going to be occupied, otherwise not. So if I go back to here, here's Fermi's golden rule. It says that the rate at which I <coughs> evolve to a new state is proportional to this coupling between the initial and final states, actually the square of the coupling, the modulus squared, times this delta function. That's Fermi's golden rule. And we typically will approximate this delta function with some sort of Lorentzian distribution or a sink distribution. Uh, we use Lorentzian just to, so that you don't have an absolute delta function. Okay. Now, what are all those energy levels? Let me go back. What are all these energy levels here? These are not different potential energy surfaces generally. This is one potential energy surface, and this is that potential energy surface with a lot of phonons added in. Okay? So these energy levels represent different phonon states that can participate to have the initial state energy kind of dissipated out, distributed out among, amongst the phonons. So here's this Fermi Golden Rule that we just kind of semi-derived. In general, it looks like this. Instead of that coupling, writing it as V naught, you write it as the inner product between initial and final states and some kind of coupling concept, usually a Coulomb interaction. This is a screen Coulomb interaction. Okay? But otherwise, it's exactly the same. This is what you find in textbooks on what's, what is Fermi's golden rule. So that's what I want to use. That's the end of my little interlude on, on Fermi's golden rule. I want to use that. Here it is. The rub now is that we have phonons. These are vibronic transitions. And the phonons are what are actually helping the, the, the electron to hop from the P3HT over to the silicon quantum dot. And so this has to include phonons. And so my Hamiltonian includes phonons. My uh, wave functions are a product of phonon wave functions and electronic wave functions. And my delta function has to reflect the fact that I have phonon energies. And so when I generalize Fermi's golden rule, I have a, a little bit of difference here. Now I have a sum over all the phonon modes, M and N, for the before and after phonon modes. So I have a big sum, and the delta function is involved at sum. So I have a whole bunch of little Fermi golden rules going on, and I'm distributing the energy out. I also have an inner product here, an overlap associated with the phonon modes themselves, pi m and pi n, the initial and final phonon modes. And I have an occupation probability associated with the, uh, with the, uh, the, uh, the states, the energy states. Okay. So now I'm going to use this Fermi Golden Rule. And the problem computationally is that no one really likes likes having a Fermi Golden Rule with a delta function. I mean, what do you, delta functions look good for like, you know, for math problems in class, but when you actually try to do something computationally with the delta function, you're at a little bit of a loss. And it's an idealization of a very tight distribution in any case. So what we do is we take this delta function and we say, what is a delta function anyway? And we write a delta function as an integral over time. If I think of this delta function, the energy as being h bar times a frequency, h bar is one in our atomic units, then I can write this as, as an inverse Fourier transform, and now I can approximate my delta function with an integral over time. And so that's all this expression is. It's still Fermi's golden rule with now an integral over time. Okay, now that's how I deal with my delta function. And now there's some additional terms that come in. When I simplify this and kind of try to massage the expression, I end up with some terms I just want to introduce to you. 
of the Huang Reis factor. The Huang Reis factor involves this idea of reorganization energy. And you can think of it as reorganization energy. It also has a phonon occupation probability. What are the odds of having, how many phonons do you actually have in each mode? And what are the frequencies of each mode? And so this is the rate at which the electron is going to hop. That's the expression that I want to use. Does everyone know what reorganization energy is? Are you good with that? A couple of you are nodding your heads. Let, let me just, I, I had it on this, this picture, and I want to make sure that you get it. Um, this is a reorganization energy lambda. Okay? It means if I take my initial state, and I have a frank condon vertical excitation, so I, I, maybe I uh, transfer the charge, uh, the electron, to the silicon quantum dot, now it's here, what's going to happen to the system? It's going to go, oh, and it's going to relax, oh, all the way down to here, right? And so that's the energy, okay? That's the reorganization energy from this point all the way down to the final state. And it, that reorganization energy is important in this Fermi-Golden rule expression that we just got, all the lambdas. In fact, we have to calculate the reorganization energy of the silicon quantum dot, the reorganization energy of the P3HT, the reorganization energy of any kind of solvent that's around that we want, that we think is relevant. Okay? So we calculate all of those things and put it, put it into this expression. Okay. We can also do a couple of, uh, a couple of idealizations. If we think that the temperature is very high relative to the phonon energies, we can simplify the expression quite a bit. And this is called Marcus theory. Okay? Delta G here is just a change in the Gibbs free energy. If, on the other hand, we have this temperature range that's kind of intermediate between the phonon energies and the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the silicon quantum dot of P3HT and the phonon energies of any solvent that we have around, then we have another expression that we can use. This is called MJL theory. Marcus Jordan, uh, oh, sorry for the L, it's not less. Um, I can't remember, but uh, MJL theory. Okay? So uh, this is a slightly easier expression, and we use both of those. In fact, we use all three. <clears throat> Yesterday I talked about computational methodology, and I had this frame in mind when I was giving you that, those lectures. We have to use density functional theory, we have to use GW theory, we have to use BSE theory in order to calc make these calculations that we've been working on with the P3HT and the silicon quantum dot. Here's what we do. We guess some initial structure. It's certainly wrong. We run a DFT calculation, and we can watch, in this case, the P3HT kind of wraps around the, the silicon quantum dot just a little bit. It kind of bends down a little bit. Now we have this relaxed structure. Then what we do is we calculate the quasi-particle wave functions for this composite structure of the silicon quantum dot with the P3HT. Then we run a CI calculation to get the electronic coupling. We run a BSE calculation to get the optical uh, gap, the material, the absorption spectrum. And then we run something called a delta SEF structure. It's a different type of DFT structure to get the Gibbs free energy. We do a Mulliken analysis to get the Coulomb energy. We do a Hessian analysis, that's a vibrational analysis, to get the phonon modes and the vibrational frequencies associated with them. And then that's how we get the Huang Reis factor in the reorganization energy. Uh, we also, for the charge hopping, because the energy of the initial and final structures is exactly the same when an electron hops between two silicon quantum dots, we have to use a different approach, not a CI approach, but we use an external field and do um, an avoidance crossing approach to measure this uh, electron coupling. And we can also um, use density functional theory to uh, um, get the uh, reorganization energy associated with the solvent. Okay, so what do we have? Here's our um, first process, the charge separation from the PHD to the uh, silicon quantum dot. Okay? That's what I want to look at. We also have this one. I'm just reminding you the photoluminescence. This one, the charge recombination at the interface. Okay. And this one, the charge hopping going over. 
And now we have the tools to quantify all of these. Okay? And here's what we get. So now I want to go slow on this plot to make sure that you understand. This is, this is the result for all of these calculations um, in several different types of approximations for the charge separation rate. And up here is our data, somewhere above 10 to the 12th for rates and sub picosecond rates. What it's saying is that for the exciton to transfer an electron to the silicon quantum dot, this is the rate at which that happens, sub picosecond rate. Okay. What's this triangle? It's for comparison. This triangle is the charge separation rate that we calculated for replacing the silicon quantum dot with PCBM. So what it says is that the charge separation is much faster for the silicon quantum dot than for the PCBM. All right. Now, this is the charge recombination. All right. So if you have the, uh, this is the photoluminescence rate. If you have the exciton on the P3HT and it photoluminesces faster than the charge uh, separation, then it's no good, right? And so Matt touched on this already. You want this number to be much lower than that number. And in fact, it is, okay? So here are our calculations for the, uh, for the uh, recombination rate. And you can see it's several orders of magnitude lower. Okay, that's good. Next, this is the charge recombination rate associated with the interface. So if the charge separates, and now it's a dissociated exciton, it's also going to go back, right? There's a rate at which it goes back to a regular exciton on the P3HT. And it turns out that that's also very low. Okay, that's good. So that's orders of magnitude lower. And so that so far, the charge separation is, is very much winning. And finally, the charge popping over here is very high. Okay, so the electron pops very fast from dot to dot to dot, much faster than the recombination uh, at the interface back to the exciton on the P3HT. Another thing that we have here is this is the recombination rate associated with the uh, PCBM. This is the recombination rate associated with the uh, with the silicon quantum dot. And so the recombination rate associated with the silicon quantum dot is much slower than for the PCBM, and that's good news too. So in both cases here where we're comparing with the PCBM, the silicon quantum dot gives superior results. Okay. There's one point here where uh, the uh, experiment is different than the theory, and that's in the charge hopping. So the electron hopping is much slower in actual measurements than what we have predicted. Orders of magnitude slower. And we think that's just because the, uh, the defects associated with the system, maybe the chart, the changes in the size, the dot fluctuations that Matt talked about are causing mobility to be less. So theoretically here, we're assuming an idealized system and we really need to be assuming um, defects and the fluctuations in the, in the geometry. Okay. All right, so what, what do we have? We have this first principles method, first principles in quotes, because as I talked about yesterday, you really have a lot of constitutive theory that goes into these models. Okay, first principles method to quantify the phonon assisted process, we're using Fermi's golden rule. Our approach, though, is based on DFT, GW, configuration interaction, and BSE calculations. And so we're limited to um, small hundreds of atoms in doing these calculations. The real computational bottlenecks are doing the GW calculations to get these quasi-particle uh, wave functions and energy, and also, surprisingly, to do the vibrational analysis. You take these systems, and you want to calculate the vibrational modes, and you've got 100 atoms, and you have, so now you have 300 vibrational modes, right? And the way you calculate each of these modes is to move one atom in the x direction and calculate the energy and move that same atom a little bit more in the x direction and calculate the energy and do a quadratic fit. 
and you do that for every coordinate for every atom. And so uh, that's really slow. And for these big systems, it's a it's a almost a deal breaker. Okay, we can get reasonable results. We can get qualitative reasonable results just doing DFT calculations without the GW and BSE, just looking at trends. But we need to have a highly parallelized code that's not in existence yet to these vibrational uh, analyses. The codes that we use, uh, I'll just throw out some names, density functional theory, we use Siesta a lot. This is a public domain code. Has anyone used this code before? Okay, so this is, if, you're, if you ever do DFT, don't, don't, don't buy codes. Okay, they're free, all right? Siesta is a, a code that's free. Uh, DMOL, I just said don't buy codes, but I buy this one because um, it's really good. It's 10 grand a year to license it, but it's worth it. Um, it's like a great drug. And, and uh, then there's Parsec. This is Jim Tolkowski's uh, code. It's part of an RGWBS suite at UT Austin. Uh, Sigma is what we use for the GW code. Again, it's part of this RGWBS suite that's, that UT Austin puts out, Tchaikovsky's group, and same with the BSC. Uh, I mentioned these folks uh, yesterday, I'll, I'll mention them again. Um, in this case, it's uh, Hwashan Lee who has done all of these calculations, and she's very quick and amazingly good at doing these very complicated calculations. Uh, Jibin Lin, a research professor with me, and Jigong Wu, a colleague in our department, are also doing uh, this work with me, and as is Alberto Francis Ketty at Enron. With that, I'll close and answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. What you want to have is, you know, treat them both as a chromophore, right? They're, they're both generating exotons. separately and, and the environment separately we assume it uh, actually we get the environment uh, empirically um, I'm, I'm trying to think Gary uh, I, I don't want to try to invent the number but I I do have those numbers yeah let's see If I go back to, um, wow, this guy had a lot of slides. Okay, so, um, so that's the, the, I use a DFT to calculate the difference in the, in the ground state energies. So I'm treating that as my delta G. I'm not including, all right, if you're thinking, uh, should I be including entropic effects or anything like that, I'm not. Yeah, yeah. So I'm surprised that I would suggest that if you made a device of silicon quantum dot, it effectively wouldn't work better than the DCDM. That's just an empirical observation that every time people try to mix something with a conjugated part of the to go to the DCDM, it never is. So are you, are you boldly stating that if we made you make silicon quantum dots with the right size? I, I think it, it's a it's a the idealized result is that yes the the uh, silicon quantum dots would be better but I think Matt talked about this quite a bit that the defects involved and the fluctuations in size whatever you want to call the non idealities. Are, are really crucial, and we're not accounting for those at all here. Yeah. 
So yeah, if you could, if you had a magic machine that made perfect silicon bottom dots all the same size, and you put them in. Yes, I boldly state that I think that would be better than the PCP. <laughs> Um, and that's just based on the fact that I've looked at both of them under these idealized circumstances and the silicon quantum dot is better. Yeah, those darn molecules haven't made. Yeah, that's, that's right. Yes. So you showed these rings um, for, a, I'm guessing, a certain size dot. Is yes. The, uh, where is this range as far as how big of a dot you can do? And if you look at the size dependence, I assume it's smaller than what we can make now. And as we get closer and closer to what kind of dots we can make in lab, um, do these rates still hold the same uh, trends? Yeah, these, you say smaller than we can make right now because you know me. This is, um, the, these dots are about a nanometer and a half in diameter. So they're on the order of you know, what we're, we're angling towards, right? But they are very small. Um, and uh, we have uh, started to look at variations. Everything's completely different as, a, you, know, as you change the size, right? So um, we've started to look at that. Uh, and uh, we've done it only so far with exciton transport, not with the, with the uh, charge transport. But that, that will make a huge difference. Okay, any other questions? I have a, a quick question. So when you're, uh, it sounds like you explicitly calculate the vibrational modes of yeah. your yeah. of your atoms. Is there a lot of sensitivity to what the surrounding matrix is like? Yeah, yeah, it's um, it's really frustrating. That's, <laughs> but it's true because the, there's a reorganization energy associated with the the dot the uh, matrix around is dielectric. There's a screening associated with it. And we have to account for that one way or another. And those values have a, a huge impact on the, on the final result. Uh, so uh, we do have to at least estimate those values. It, am I answering your question? Or? Yeah, this is uh, basically what I was wondering. Yeah. Um, so then you, you sort of make your best estimate of what the interaction is between the surrounding matrix and the atoms that you're treating explicitly, and then put those in as parameters. We don't, we don't estimate the interaction, what we do, well, in a way we do, we say, what is the reorganization energy associated, in that, in that, in that sense, an interaction, yeah, and what is the dielectric screening of the matrix, that's right, and that um, contributes to the total, if you look at that Fermi-Golden rule, contributes to the total uh, reorganization energy that's in an exponential, and so it can be very important. Yeah. Part of the frustration, I should say here, is that it's, it's the frustration of exponentials, Right? And, and you know, you may say as a, as a theorist, ha, I can get the, the energies of these systems within you know, uh, a tenth of an EV, yay me. No, that's no good. Right? That's, you know, getting within a tenth of an EV raised to an exponential is an uh, order of magnitude or two off in terms of the, the rates that you're interested in. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? All right, uh, if not, let's thank uh, Mark.